there was a, a period of time during my life where I went to a lot of weddings. I kind of felt like I was going to a lot of weddings in a row. And it was kind of in a time of my life where I had no money to give gifts to people for those weddings. Uh, oftentimes, because I was going to the weddings of friends... I would run into some of the same people because it would be like our same group of friends going to the same people's weddings oftentimes. And one couple that we saw regularly was a couple where the, the wife, she loves to dance. And the husband was a little more reluctant and he was kind of happy to stick around at the tables and kind of chit chat with everybody there. And she, the wife, she said the funniest thing. I don't know if I've ever told you this story before, but she said the funniest thing. She said, if he'll just go out on the dance floor, I'll dance around him. <laughs> he just needs to stand there. My wife loves to pull this story out with me because I also am somebody who's a little more reluctant. I don't necessarily want to go out and dance. And so she's like, if you'll just stand there, I will dance around you. I, I have made the commitment, I always, I will go, I will definitely dance one dance at every wedding. I will dance one dance, even if it means that she just has to dance around me. <laughs> Partly it's because I don't necessarily have great rhythm. I don't think that's really uh, my gift to the world, uh, dancing. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you love to dance? All right, all right. There are a lot of dancers. Uh, the rest of us, we can be the dance E, where they dance around us. Uh, if you love to dance, or at least if you love music, it's probably because you either have great rhythm, or maybe uh, you are, love to hear the beat and dance around with it, or maybe you just don't care what you look like. Maybe that's okay, too. That's fine. Like slow, dance. slow dances. Woo! All right. <laughs> that middle school kind of sway thing. That's good. It's good. I like that. You know what? There's hope for me yet. There's, it doesn't all take so much rhythm, does it? You just got to move a little bit. Uh, if, if you love music, if you love slow dancing, like Steve does over here that I heard, um, if you love that, it may interest you to know that the, the life of faith can actually be connected to or may, may be compared to a dance. It's, it's a dance, a rhythm. And in the book of Philippians that we're going to look at right now, the Apostle Paul will invite us to be people who are determined to follow heaven's rhythm. That we should be people, if we're Christians, we should be determined to follow heaven's rhythm. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can open it to Philippians. There are Bibles that are in the back. Every, you, know, you can always grab one of those. And if you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take one of those New Testaments, the little white ones there to take home with you as well. We're going to look at Philippians 3 and start in verse 17. It says this, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is, on, is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's pray. Father, we, we ask you to teach us, shape us, we know that your Holy Spirit is speaking words and, and teaching our hearts. We pray that we will have our eyes on Jesus to understand the, the depth and riches of your love for us in Christ Jesus so that you, our triune God, may be honored in the way that you should be in this world, in our lives, everywhere, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we, we are celebrating our 60th anniversary, and uh, even if it's your first time here today, I hope that you will stick around afterwards, eat, celebrate with us, enter into the joy of that. Uh, as, as a way of celebrating or kind of marking this moment, uh, we have been framing our discussion about this by using Philippians 3. This is our third week of looking at that. Uh, we've been saying this is, this is what our past kind of looks like, and it's a way for us to say we hope that our future will look like this as well. 
So if you have been reading with us as Philippians 3, uh, in Philippians 3, you, you can see how the, the themes that we've been talking about uh, are the ones that we want to be planted in for the future. And I think they, decide, they also describe our past. And what, what drew me to Philippians 3 was that one of the main themes here is this encouragement that we should be determined. And it's this description of our, of our church's history, right? We have been determined, and we want that to be our future as well, that we want to be people who are determined. So a couple of Sundays ago, we explored our identity as people who have been determined by God, not just by our heritage or our achievements, but through knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. And so God determines who we are as Christians. And last week, we focused on what it means for us to grow in spiritual maturity. We said that mature Christians are determined to advance in their faith, to not stay where they are, but to move forward in their faith. Rather than falling into complacency or feeling any sense of despair about what's happened in the past, it could be good things, it could be bad things, but we say, uh, we, for we move forward, we advance in our faith, and we're determined to do so. Today... I just read a few of the final lines of Philippians 3, and the final piece of determination that Paul wants to point us toward is that, that so Paul, uh, God has determined who we are. God has determined that we're supposed to be pressing on, and now it, to stay in that identity, we should be determined to follow heaven's rhythm. So if you're a Christian, I want you, we, Paul wants us, God wants us to be determined to follow heaven's rhythm. And people who are determined to follow heaven's rhythm have three characteristics. They, they follow other people who are already dancing the rhythm. They don't follow those who are offbeat. And then we tune our ears to the song of heaven. All right, let's look at those. So first, we're, we're going to follow people already dancing the rhythm. It says in verse 17, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, so not just me, but look around to other people, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he says, my life, my life is a model. That's a pretty bold statement already. And he says, if you see me doing things, then do that stuff. Follow what I'm doing. For a lot of us, our Christian faith wasn't necessarily taught to us. Maybe you learned about it from someone else. It's something that you caught on to. Somebody did maybe talk to you about faith, but you got to see their life of faith. You got to follow what they did. Somebody who is following this rhythm of spiritual living, and you said, I want to continue in that way. If it was just words, it's meaningless. Paul describes what spiritual looks like, the spiritual life looks like elsewhere. It's described in terms that I think I, I connect to rhythm. Maybe you're familiar with a passage in Galatians that talks about the fruit of the Spirit. What, this, what the Spirit produces in us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the kind of stuff that the Spirit starts to bring out of us in our life. What you might not remember, though, is that just after that verse... What Paul says, he, he ties this then to, the, he ties these character traits to a rhythm of faith. He says in Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, that let us also keep in step with the Spirit. He says, if, if we're going to live by the Spirit, we need to keep that rhythm with the Spirit. So it's those characteristics of the life of the Spirit that, that come out of us. It's the things that we've We've talked about even over the last couple of weeks. It's, it's living in humility. It's desiring to grow in faith. It's becoming people who are joyful and faithful and humble. It's being people of prayer and people of generosity. It's being people of worship, people of the word. But what Paul's saying in Philippians 3.17 is, is that this example of other people helps give us an image of what faithfulness looks like in real people. It doesn't have to be superheroes even. It can be regular people that you've seen live their life of faith. So we need to follow his example and keep our eyes on those who follow his model of life. That these are people who are already dancing to the rhythm of faith. 
Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna look for a little bit of audience participation here, fair warning. Just, just for this one, easy, okay. <laughs> so what are, what are some of the things that you've seen? What are some of these patterns or rhythms of faithfulness that you've seen in other people? What are some of these things where you say, wow, that person is, is dancing to the rhythm of heaven? What are some examples of faithfulness you've seen? Reading the Bible. Compassion. Compassion. Good one. Volunteering. Volunteering. Joy. Joy. Especially in, when circumstances aren't very happy. Generosity. Generosity. Wonderful. Prayer. What was that? Prayer. Prayer. Contentment. Contentment. Wow. Deep. Peace. Peace. Patience, humility. humility, hope, I heard. Did you say coffeeness? <laughs> Compliments, happiness, yes. I thought, I want that, is what I, I thought. I'm, I'm almost there in the coffeeness. I missed the one over here. Yeah, forgiveness, yes. Worship, somebody whose life moves toward worship. Are you thinking of people when you think of this? I've seen people exude these things. I've seen people who are joyful in difficulty. I've, I've met people who are so quietly, amazingly generous with their time, uh, with their resources, with their money, and they, they just kind of do it real quietly. There's people who, who worship and can and want to see God glorified in, in kind of everyday circumstances, not, not making a big deal out of it. I, I mean, there's people that want to sing, of course, but they, there's people that just say, I, I want my life to point to God. That, that's a life of worship. Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen examples of faith. I, I think of, of people in my life who were really good at inviting other people in, uh, people who, who kind of didn't believe what was on the outside, but believe that that's, maybe that's tied to when somebody said hope. They believe who somebody is going to become. I think those are examples of faithfulness. Thank you for that. These are examples of what faith looks like. And I hope that you have people in your life who show you those things. Because we need to see them. Because sometimes it's a little hard to understand just from the instruction booklet. Do you, do you know that little rubber gasket that goes around your door? I don't know if you ever noticed it. When you, in your car door, when you open it, there's like a, a rubber seal that kind of goes around it. Recently, uh, in, I don't know whatever, in the last six months, mine started to break on my car. And uh, I have an amazing mechanic who I trust implicitly. He's really great. He deserves every dollar I give him when he does it. But when I do the work for me, I work for free. So I'm like, you know what? This thing's broken. I'm going to ask the free guy first to do this. Uh, so free guy got the, the, the new gasket, and it's a weird shape. And I'm like, I, have, I think I don't know how to do this. I thought that after I had ripped the old one off, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> so when you drive around, it's like, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm like, I need to figure this out. We live in an age, a beautiful, wonderful age of YouTube. Blessed be the Father. Uh, so I, I went to a, a YouTube video of a guy who changed the gasket on my model of car. He's like, right? And I, he probably has changed gaskets on like 500 cars or something, and that's why he does it. So he's like, so I didn't have to go and try to figure out what the instructions were that came with the thing and, and try to figure out how to do it. I just saw him do it. He goes, see this piece here? When, I mean, this is going to be a problem. Just push this part a little bit harder. And then it's, oh, you're going to have a little trouble here. I just saw him do it, and then I could do it. And that's what can happen to us in our faith life. We want to apply the scriptures, of course. But it helps me when I see what it looks like. It's one thing for me to, is to read in scripture where it says, you should be generous. It's another thing for me to see my friend Rob pay for somebody else's hotel room. I, I see him do it. And so what I hear from that is, you're going to get to a point where it's gonna, you're going to think, this has cost $200, I don't want to do this, and you just push a little harder and you pay for the guy, whatever. I saw faith lived out, and I know what it looks like. So I feel a little bit more like I can do it. 
And that's what Paul wants us to do. He says, you have here, you have examples of faith around you, invitations to come and follow. The question is, who, who are we looking up to? Who is somebody that you have in your life who you want to look like? And, and it doesn't have to be every aspect of their life. You can say, hey, I, I want to pray like this person. I want to be somebody who knows the word like this person. So Paul is telling us we need to look for some people who will be good examples to us to, and, and even to be people who will cheer us on in the faith. Maybe if you told that person, I, I want to learn to pray, I think that they will cheer you on and, and ask you about that. And Paul says, follow my example. A few verses along, he even goes farther. In Philippians 4, 9, he says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. That is a pretty high example. I don't know how many of us in the room would be willing to say that to other people, especially not write it in a letter. But the example that he wants people to follow is, is the words that he speaks. He says, the way that I talk, the way that I act, the way that I do that, he invites you to follow me. I think there's a great challenge for us in that. Knowing that Christianity is not just taught, but it's caught. I think it's important in our parenting. It's important in our faith. And, and parents and grandparents, there's a great challenge for us in that. Uh, our kids are learning about what faith looks like from watching us. What are they learning about what it means to be people who are honest, people who are faithful, people who, had, who need to go to the Lord for forgiveness? The encouragement... We are all meant to be ex godly examples to other people. We're certainly not going to live up to it. Maybe we need to also show that part about coming to God. So the question we can ask is, hey, how are we being a model to other people too? Are we dancing the dance of faith in a way that we would want other people to follow? Second, don't follow those people who are off beat. <laughs> it's important on a worship team. It's important on the dance floor. It's important in faith. So we're choosing to not be shaped by those people who are not wanting to follow God. Verse 18. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. If we want to dance to the heavenly rhythm, we're going to need to recognize dissonance when we hear it or see it. Notice when other people are offbeat. Uh, it, it says that there are people who are enemies of the cross. There are people who, who don't want to follow what God has. And, and he says destruction is their destiny. Uh, basically, the hope that they're putting their life into is, is empty. There's, there's nothing behind that. They're hoping that it'll just work out. They're hoping something. And, and it says that these enemies of the cross, that their, their God is their stomach. Uh, what that means is that they, they, they just follow their own desires. They follow their own passions. They're, they're driven by their own appetites. So much of what's around us today tells us that we should get everything that we desire. There are a lot of people dancing to that rhythm. And, and rather than embracing the cross and we should be able to ad adopt the kinds of patterns in our life that actively fight against just telling us that we should just get everything that we want. Because the way of the cross, as Jesus has shown us, is, is the way of self-sacrifice, the way of living for other people. It, it's, it's a way that, that, that says that you shouldn't be generous necessarily it, unless there's something in it for you. The way that it says that we shouldn't be patient unless it gives us something in the end. Instead, the way of the cross calls us into that life of discipleship because that's reflective of the life of heaven. We can start to think that God's purpose... Uh, there's an easy way that we get inf infected by this. We start to think that, that God's purpose is primarily a purpose for our life. That... There are people out there who think that God's 
God exists in order to fulfill our desires, to give me what I want. It follows then that if, if we are not feeling fulfilled, if our lives are not where we want, then it, there must be a problem of our faith. Maybe that's why I'm not getting what I want because I am not praying hard enough or God's not giving me that thing. I just want to achieve what I already wanted, and that's I want God as a part of my life just to help out with that. The message of the Bible, though, is that if we want to be fulfilled in our lives, then we need to begin to conform our lives and our desires to God's. We aren't driven by our own wants and needs, but by seeing God's larger purpose in the world and and fitting our life in the and flowing in the direction of God's Spirit. If God's Spirit is flowing this way, then we, we go with Him and we stop fighting against Him. For those of you who have raised children or in the, whether you are in the process of doing so or it's in the past, that there, we know that there are moments. It, it's, it's fulfilling in a larger sense, right? But in, sometimes in the day-to-day, it doesn't always feel quite so fulfilling sometimes. If we look at the short term... You might think, my desire as a parent is not being met. But what's, what's wonderful is that, is that hopefully, over time, we're able to see a larger call on our life, that, that God is, it has a greater purpose that actually supersedes some of the smaller moments of uh, destruction and despair. Is that a better way to say that um, in parenting? Because we believe in parenting, we want to believe wholeheartedly that we are a part of something bigger, a bigger purpose that's larger than any particular moment. And it's similar in our life of faith. There are going to be moments where things don't go the way we want, even if we really are doing what God wants for us. God is calling for us to be a part of his larger purposes, and we shouldn't give in to the rhythm that says, you know what, the, that's, you should just do what you want. If you, if you do what you want, then you're going to feel fulfilled. Uh, I'll, I'll say, before we move on, I want to notice, though, that Paul's attitude toward people who are enemies of the cross. He says, he is in tears. I've told you before, and I say it again with tears. There are people who are enemies of the cross. I think it, a little too often today, Christians are ready to either... They're, Either say that there's no problems in the world, like, like there's, no, there's no one who's against the cross, or to want to shout people down, and if somebody is an enemy of the cross, they, they want to attack them and go after them, to, to make them our enemies and attack them. But what Paul's example is, he recognizes that there are people who are enemies of the cross, and yet, so he's not downplaying that, and yet, he says it with tears. He's, in, he's praying over people. He's weeping for them. He says, I, I, don't, I don't want you to be fighting against God. He's like, this is a tragedy that should be wept over, not that we should be fighting people about it. If there are people who are enemies of the cross and find glory in shameful things, people who reject the Lord himself, we have to see this as a tragedy to be wept over and prayed over. I think that will shape the way that we see all of this, and even kind of what is our part in living out in his example, as an example of Christ-likeness. So don't be taken off rhythm by the world around you. Don't sit on the sidelines and lob grenades at people who are uh, against us either. Paul's way is to pray for people in tears, uh, which is also the reaction sometimes people have when they see me dancing off rhythm <laughs> as well. Weeping and in tears <laughs> when people are off rhythm. Lastly, rather than setting our minds on earthly things, we tune our ears to the song of heaven. Verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very specific. Our Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, So he's going to bring the whole world under control, and he's going to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. A couple of defining features that he highlights here, he says, hey, our citizenship is in heaven, 
We're awaiting a Savior from there, and he's going to make us like he is. But that's good news. That's hopeful. It reminds me, as we think about being citizens of heaven, that, that, we, that we pray. One of our prayers is that, that the world will be on earth as it is in heaven. That's what Jesus taught us. Jesus taught us to pray that the rhythm of heaven will be replicated on earth. That the, that the way that we live will, will show what citizenship of heaven looks like. Not, not so we earn our way to heaven, not so we, we prove that we belong there or something like that, but because that's the right good way. We want the world to operate like here as it is there. We are awaiting a savior from heaven. That's a, this is tether of hope that we know that Christ will return. Christ is going to return. And, and, and that helps because we see a lot of stuff out of control. If you were with us when we were studying the book of Job, that's one of Job's complaints to God. He's like, God, the world is not going the way that I would expect a world would go with a God like you. So what's going on? And we, our hope is that Christ will return. And, and it's great news. He says, he, everything that's out of control right now will be put under his control. He's the one who is able to do it. That's, that's good news. Because the broken things that are in my life, the broken things in the world, are, are too broken for me to be able to fix myself. It needs somebody from the outside. It needs somebody as powerful as the Lord to fix it. And that is good hope for us today. And, and, if, and knowing that transforms the way that we live now. We're losing flowers behind me, and it's fine. It transforms the way that we see our world now. Uh, I think sometimes we think, that there's a thought that people who think too much about heaven aren't going to be very useful here in the world. But I, I think that what is intended for us is the opposite. That because we know there's a heavenly hope, that we will work in this world to see that on earth it's closer to heaven. That means that we'll be people who, as citizens of heaven, awaiting a Savior, that we're going to be trying to care for people who are really hurting here, people who are isolated and marginalized here. Finally, it says he's going to make us like he is. Our, our bodies are going to get remade. That is good news. If you've got something that's aching this morning, our bodies are going to get remade. He's going to make us as he is. So even all the things that are broken in my own life, too, are also going to be brought into order. And that's good news. Because I, I can't fix my own life. As hard as I have tried to get everything in order, get all my ducks in a row, they, it does not work. No matter where you come this morning, whatever background you've come from, however how long you have been with God or maybe going on your own, I want to say God is calling you. God is inviting you into his rhythm to find godly examples of people who you can follow, to, to, to purposely turn away from broken things that aren't of heaven, but then to hope for this rhythm of heaven that God has for us. And it's a hope for our own hearts too, because nobody has ever run, danced this dance of life perfectly except for one. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's the one that we're awaiting because we cannot do it on our own, and we need God to redeem our lives by giving his life for us, and that's what he did for us. If we submit ourselves to Christ, then we are people who are awaiting him. We're not just trying to fix our world around us. We're not just trying to, to reorder our own world by our own power. We're saying, God, I, I can't do it on my own. I need you to do it. I need, I'm awaiting you from heaven, and I need you now to shape me. All right, here's my challenge for this week. I would like for you to pick one trait you've seen in someone, something you've seen in someone else who is dancing to the rhythm of heaven. And I would like for you right now to ask God to grow that in you. Does that make sense? Because I, I think if we're going to be people who are advancing in faith, we have to have these godly examples. People who show us what it looks like to not dance to the rhythm of the world, but to do it God's way, hoping for heaven. I think that's powerful. 
I think it's going to change the, the, the feeling we have in here. We don't come on to church on Sunday then hoping that Kurt has something good to say. I, I hope that we as a community together submit ourselves to the scriptures and want to learn from each other growing in faith. I think that's a beautiful, wonderful image of us together moving forward. It's what's happened over in our past and what's going to happen forward for us and hopefully the next 60, 100 years in the future. Let's pray. I'd like for you right now to think of a trait that you've seen in someone who is obviously following Paul's example, Christ's example. Would you take a moment now, speak specifically to God, to ask God to grow that trait in you. Lord, you have heard our prayers. We, we want to begin our lives to look like the citizenship that we already have. You have made us citizens of heaven by Christ's sacrifice for us. May we begin to live into that. Help us to grow that trait. Give us people in our lives who are going to be examples for us to grow that in us. And Lord, I pray for everyone who is here, that we will be godly examples to those who follow behind us, people who are new to the faith, people who are, are just coming back, people who are uh, little kids who are growing up learning about you. May you be glorified. We want, as people dancing to the rhythm of heaven, for in the end, all the, all the glory to go back to you, that people will say, that God is good, because he's brought these people together around you. May you be glorified, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.